My name is Bob Shook. I am the head of advanced product innovation at Thomson Reuters. I have some really good news for you, maybe. Um, besides being the last speaker of the day, I have no PowerPoint, none whatsoever. I don't do PowerPoint. I got to give a special shout out to these three guys here sitting up front. Last year, um, I spoke over on the other side at the Accountex event in the technology theater, I think it was, and it was sort of spilling out. And these guys were in the front row then. And as they were saying, really, the only thing they're missing is an amber shirt here. And we'd have like the traffic light. I also promise you that I will not talk for 45 minutes. And I apologize ahead of time that I do not have a costume to wear like the previous speaker who came out looking a bit like the Linux penguin guy, whatever. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here to get a chance to speak to you today. Uh, it's a little bit of a different topic. Um, I have really this, this cool role at, at Thomson Reuters. I've been there just under five years. And before that, I worked at uh, Motorola for 18 years and Turner Broadcasting, the parent company of CNN, for about uh, five years. And last year, these guys got to see me wearing Google Glass. I got to call myself a glass hole on stage. Everybody laughed. Google Glass is now sitting in a drawer somewhere. We've moved on. But we're going to talk a little bit about glass and some other interesting things. So I didn't, I have like no knowledge whatsoever, relatively speaking, of professionals. I don't look like a professional. I don't dress like a professional. I'm not really professional in how we're going to present today. It's going to be a little bit of a different kind of presentation, and I hope you like it. These guys didn't think it was so bad. They came back to see part two this year. So hopefully it'll be pretty good. Um, so let me just start off with, with kind of a little story, because stories are always fun. And this is going to be a bit of like improv. Um, I was talking to one of my colleagues at Thomson Reuters, and I was thinking about how my dad used to go to work in the old days. And he'd hop in the car, and he'd drive to work, and he worked for an electric utility in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where I grew up. And dad would do his bit there. He'd come home at night at 5 o'clock at night. He might have his briefcase, a little bit of work to do, but that was it. And then he had sort of the rest of the evening to play catch or take us to baseball practice or to do those things that dads always do. And that kind of formulated a bit of what we'll talk about today. So in four plus years at Thomson Reuters, um, I've had the opportunity to take us on an amazing journey. When I joined the company, um, I was asked by our CTO, James Powell, to do an assessment of our mobile products. And he said, you know, take 30 to 45 days, go look at everything out there, and then come back and tell me what you think. And the interesting thing about it was CNN competed with Reuters, so I knew that news app, but I really didn't know much about the rest of the company. And it was just after the merger of Thomson Financial Services and, and Reuters. And I thought, eh, this can't be that big a deal. Come on, this big company, they probably ought to have it figured out. Ten slides or less, like a Domino's pizza, and I'll be done. And it just shows how stupid I was about the size and scale of the things we did as a company. And you know, you turn over a rock, and that led to another and another and another. And the thing that I discovered straight out of the gate was that we really sucked at developing mobile products. And right now, I'm sure the Thomson Reuters people in the audience, especially my marketing communications people, are going, I can't believe you just said our products sucked. They sucked. Actually, they ranged from eh to god awful. And it wasn't just us, though. I think it was a problem in general with products that come in what we call the quote unquote professional services space, where we all believe that our content and our information and the things we have that we sell to professionals, whether they be lawyers, people that work um, in the city, in the financial services space, people that work like our tax and accountant colleagues across the way, we thought our information was so good and so useful that people would put up with whatever experience we chose to give them. And they just, you know, they dealt with it. And we're like, who cares? They're writing us big checks for our information. And so what? They got to go live with it. Um, but that's clearly not the case. And that's kind of going to be one theme to remember in the back of your mind. So, so just remember design. Because design is something that we've really focused on within our company. And we've been very fortunate. And I promise this isn't going to be a Thompson Reuters sales pitch. But we've been very fortunate that in the four plus years I've been there, we've had two 
applications, the wider image and Reuters News selected as Apple Editor's Choice Picks. And when that happens, you get promoted in the top carousel from Apple, and you don't get buried amongst the gazillions of apps that happen to be in the store. And we've had numerous apps uh, besides those two that have been featured by Apple and said new and noteworthy and go download these things. So we sort of got the design thing figured out, which is sort of an important thing. So one of the things that I discovered is that there's this word that's used in the legal community and in the tax community and in the financial services community, and it's a word that kind of makes me barf a lot. And you'll hear this word here probably over and over and over, and you probably know what this word is. It begins with a W. It's the dreaded workflow. I hate that word. I hate it with a passion. Because to me, what workflow represents is a mindset of professionals from 25 years ago instead of the mindset of up and coming 25 year old professionals. Workflow is defined by so many people is that experience you get from the time you plunk down yourself at your desk and in the case of legal, you're doing matter management and search and billing and time tracking and all this stuff. And then you get up and you leave at the end of the day and you go home. And that's kind of how my dad worked and all those years ago. He'd come in, he did his job, there was some workflow to it, I'm sure, and then he came home. And that's just such old school ways of thinking about products. And, and that's actually what I think drove a lot of the first generation professional service mobile products that were created. Um, you'd have this big desktop experience, this workflow thing that was built for a PC, and then we'd go and we'd take it and we'd shrink it down and we created what I called the skinny jeans version for the iPad. And as you know, skinny jeans, a bit of a trend these days, sometimes they really look good, sometimes not so good. I wear skinny jeans myself. You can tell me. Maybe I suck wearing these. I don't know. But the point is, that was always the thing. We'd take these big desktop things and we'd shrink it down to an iPad to a smaller display, and we'd call that our mobile product. And basically all we do is put the workflow on the iPad. And then we'd say, right, let's go create the iPhone version or the Blackberry version or the Android version. And we'd create what I call the anorexic product. And no anorexic product ever looks good, ever. End of story. And that was because of the mindset that we always had, which was how do we take these desktop workflow things and turn them into mobile experiences? Because clearly everybody wants to do all the things on the desktop that they're doing in the mobile space. Wrong. Such a silly way to think about how products are developed. And we should have thought about the fact that, you know, the way consumer products come to market, they're designed with very specific purposes, very specific things that you do. Not all mobile apps are great, but in general, they're much more designed to fit for the type of screen that you have. So that's sort of a second thing to think about, is kind of how professional products have evolved over time. Well, because I hate that word workflow, I had to come up with a new word. And, and the word that I would love for all of you to think about, and I'm sorry I keep doing this with my hair, um, it's like some kind of weird breeze I'm getting back here, um, is a word I call day flow. You're like, what's that? It sounds like some BS thing that this guy's invented. And there's a lot of terms that this could represent, day flow, blur flow, whatever you want to call it. But what it really boils down to is this. When my dad worked all those years ago, he went in, he did his job, he came home, and that was it. Every so often he might have a little bit of homework, but pretty much that was it, right? It was an eight to five thing. But I would venture none of us in this room have an eight to five experience anymore. And in fact, I would venture that one of the first things every single one of you did this morning when you woke up is you picked up your mobile device and you looked at it. And I'm probably right. And I have this really bad joke that I sometimes tell, so I'm gonna violate some protocol, but it generally is the number one or the number two thing that you do in the morning, or sometimes while you're doing number one and number two, you're on this device. And there's a lot of stats behind that too. And now my marketing people are really going, how are we gonna ever publish this video after he said this? Uh, but it's true, right? So the very first thing we do in the morning is we look at our mobile devices. And then what's the last thing we do before we go to bed at night? We're looking at our damn mobile devices again, right? 
there is no such thing as work-life balance anymore. It really is a blur. But because it's a blur, it means we have opportunities to do things a little bit differently. And we can get into the argument of, does this actually make us more productive, or does it not make us more productive? I had another conversation with somebody this morning about this very topic. I don't know that it does make us more productive, but I think part of the problem with productivity and deciding whether or not it's, it's, it's good, all this electronic access we have all the time, it simply boils down to this. If you're sitting there and you're at work, you know, in the old days, you didn't have a computer, you didn't have somebody saying, hey, I just ate a banana and I posted it on Facebook. You didn't have a tweet saying, Arsenal somehow blew it again, you know, and are probably gonna, you know, end up finishing fourth in the league and have to go f qualifying Champions League. You know, we didn't have all those distractions back then, right? We just simply had the telephone sitting on our desk, and that was kind of about it, and the stuff that we had to go do. Well, where I think things are really going is not so much about workflow anymore, but about day flow. And day flow is really representative of what we do from the time we wake up in the morning until the time we go to bed at night. And what does that mean for the kinds of solutions and things we need to go and create? Because go back to that comment I made earlier. Workflow was designed for the professionals of 25 years ago. Dayflow is product for 25-year-old professionals who have grown up with the internet, who have been part of the amazing boom of mobile phone technology. I and mean, when you think about it, it was only 12 years ago, literally 12 years ago, that 3G came to the United Kingdom. On 3303, Hutchison Wampoa launched 3G here with big, bulky phones. I did it, I did a couple of them at Motorola. 30 minutes of battery life and people thinking, wow, this is the future, you know? But look how fast that changed. And how suddenly none of us would think for two seconds about leaving for, from home in the morning or going out without our iPhones or our Android devices. Our phones are so much part of our life. In fact, I'm staying down, um, uh, down in the city, and I almost took a picture. I almost had one thing I was going to show today, which is just the remarkable fact that if you look at most people at this conference, and, you know, this guy's doing it back here. Oh, no, he's actually writing. I take it back. I thought he was doing what, he, what I was going to say. This is what most people are doing. They're like this. And we're walking into posts, and we're hitting other people because we're looking at these stupid things all the time, hundreds of times in the day. So when you're doing something like that, that tells me that while it is important, and this is, this is not to trivialize what gets created for the office environment and the workflow associated with the office environment, there's a much bigger problem to solve and a much bigger reality out there that says no matter what we do, we're staring at screens every part of our day. In fact, I got this fancy new title that's up here that I mentioned in the beginning, Head of Advanced Product Innovation. And people say, what does that mean at Thomson Reuters? Because any innovation word, I mean, that's like, right? Innovation is like this sucky word that everybody uses and throws around. So there's an elevator speech that we always ask entrepreneurs to be able to give you about an organization. I can give you the elevator button press speech for what this organization is all about. Watch. If it has a screen, it's fair game. And that's the mantra that we're using in our organization to think about the future of solutions that we need to create and build for people. So these are things that encompass the phone when you wake up. They recognize the fact that Apple sold a few Apple watches, didn't they, about a month or so ago. And Android's got a few smart watches out there too. That's another screen that you've got. You get in the car and you look at some of the new car manufacturers building in Android Auto or Apple CarPlay or their own crappy display things that they already have up there. There's big displays going on in the car. And cars are becoming more and more connected to the internet. An ability for you to do some things once you're in the car. You've got your tablets. We're going to have smart appliances doing amazing things. Now, what are we going to go do as an industry? Well, I'll tell you. We'll create Westlaw next and we'll squeeze it onto a watch. No, we won't do that. We are absolutely not going to create and take the existing products that we have and try to jam into these little bitty displays. 
But I'll tell you the model we are going to follow or what we're going to pay close attention to, and that's this. These screens are very personal to us. And in fact, if I ask for anybody's phone, do you have your phone on you out of curiosity? Do you mind if I borrow it? Thanks. Appreciate it. Let's just, oh, so she knows we're fine. Let's watch how long it takes before the sweat beads start running down her face. Because we all start freaking out when these things get out of our grasp, don't they? What's he going to do? Is he going to like poke buttons? Is he going to look at something? Do I have something that's going to get pushed to me that I don't want him to see? These are so personal, so us. And that's what Google now is doing exceptionally well, for those of you that have Android devices or have loaded this on your iOS device. I never, ever, ever again, ever have to ask for an Arsenal football score. Why? Because Google has mined my search information over and over and over and proactively tells me ahead of time, Arsenal lost 1-0 to Swansea the other night. Doesn't have to tell me that the St. Louis Cardinals, my baseball team in the US, lost 2-0. It's all pushed to me. Doesn't have to tell me that I need to leave here to hustle over to City Airport to catch my flight to Zurich tonight because it's already there. It knows that in my calendar and says, it's time to leave if you want to get there to make your flight. These things that Google now are already doing in the consumer space, anticipating my needs, anticipating the things I need, they're all about creating a contextual, personal, and relevant experience for consumers. And that is the message you need to take away. That is the future of the types of solutions we have to create, whether we're legal professionals, financial services, any type of professional. We have to recognize that the up and coming 25 year old professionals of today who have been born, lived, and raised through the growth of the internet, through the growth of smartphones, through having all these screens hitting them perpetually, that's the way they want to work. They want to be able to use their mobile devices. They want to be able to use their tablets. They're going to connect these watches up to stuff to measure their heart rate and things like that. So when we think about the kinds of solutions that we need to create as an industry, full stop, we have to think about what is it that I can provide you in those 30 seconds, 30 seconds max in the morning when you wake up to tell you something useful, something you can make a decision on for later in the day. When you decide to go out and have a run in Hyde, Hyde Park, if something happens, some case you're following, some stock movement that's taking place in Asia, and you get a little push on your watch, what do I need to do about that? I don't care about the performance of some Joe Blog stock, but if I own a big stake in Apple, or if in, in the case of Ericsson suing Apple, that suddenly means the Apple phones can't be sold in the US anymore, that might be a big deal to a legal professional. It certainly would be a big deal to a financial trader who would probably care about the short-term impact that could have on revenue and sales. When I'm in the vehicle, this is always a tricky one, right? Because we don't really want drivers yarking around with their displays too much. People are already doing stupid things in their car. And with more and more cyclists in London, we don't want cyclists getting run over either. But what could we do? Well, obviously, what autos do exceptionally well is they're really good at knowing how long is it going to take for me to get from my house to where I'm commuting to. So we've got really, really good traffic management systems that are out there. And we also have the ability to deliver audio. So why not stitch together an audio program of interesting and relevant and useful content that helps me prep up for the day? So it's a little bit different than, say, listening to Chris Moyles in the morning or a Radio 4 shipping forecast or whatever you might listen to when you're commuting in the morning. Talk sport, my favorite. I love talk sport. Probably tell I like talk sport because I like sport. Once you get to the office, the workflow, building great products, that doesn't go away. You build for the things that work best on that screen. You take advantage of the real estate. You take advantage of the mouse. You take advantage of all the things that a big screen and a big office environment can give you. Consistent connectivity, for example. But when you leave at the end of the day, all these things unwind. Whether you're back in the car, commuting on the train, you're out exercising, you're with your family, you're laying in bed next to your spouse, your significant other, your dog, your cat, whatever it happens to be, we provide you with that contextual, 
relevant personal information that works for the device you have, with the screen you have, with what's most important to you. And that's fundamentally what Dayflow is all about. I don't really think it's anything that people can argue with too much when you think about it. Yes, is it too much technology in our face? Potentially. But the idea is not to say you have to be engaging with my content or my competitor's content every single time I commute in the morning. But it is simply to say that you've thought about the design, you've thought about the fact that all these screens are going to be here, and what can I craft to create something that's useful, immediate, and actionable in that moment when somebody wants the information given the screen that they have available to them. And there's a whole bunch of other things you have to think about behind the scenes, because in most of our businesses, we like to know who you are because of the way we sell things around subscription. There's issues around security. I'm not going to downplay any of that kind of stuff. But fundamentally, this is the thing that you know will all get worked out in the back end that Google is doing today. So that's the biggest thing I want to leave you with before I open it up for some questions here. Dayflow is really about creating that personal, connected, relevant information on any screen. Any screen is fair game. And that's the mentality I think all of us have to have as we design our products going forward. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. And I'm very happy to take any questions you might have. Cheers. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, where do you get your source of inspiration from? My source of inspiration? Uh, well, multiple places. So everybody, you know, people always like to know, for example, your favorite app. That's like one of the greatest party tricks. This is, in fact, this is a party trick you should try with people if you haven't done this. Um, since we have a couple minutes, let's actually do it because this is a good thing. Did you guys see this party trick last year? I think you may have. Yeah, I'm not going to ask you. Favorite app and why? Um, oh, my God. Google Maps. Because? Because it gets me from A to B and it has, you know, Great alternative route advice. Beautiful. Google Maps. Lovely young lady whose phone I got to steal. Favorite app of life? Oh, oh, it's really embarrassing. I no, can't. Uh, um, I've got a 10 year old niece and she's just got me onto Crossy Road. Crossy, I got that too. And um, on uh, the tube, if you can't, um, oh, damn, I should have said TED Talks because I do that on the tube as well. So on the tube, you know, you don't need Wi Fi, yeah. so you can just like kill time doing it and cool. yeah. Um. Turn around and tell people. <laughs> they want to see your smiling face. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Favorite app. Well, um, I'm I'm not using um apps for entertainment that much. Okay. My favorite apps at the moment is actually Office 365. <laughs> Sorry, because? <laughs> because it is um, really it is also very user friendly, and um, I can keep up with the email update all the time. That's correct. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with saying Office 365. We're all stuck using Microsoft products largely, so Google Maps. I'm gonna you know even though you said TED Talks Crossy Road because that's a cool app. It's funny. Office 365. You guys can't play because you know the answer to this. But what was the common thing among these three apps? And by the way, do this party trick at home. It works every time, guaranteed. Anything? Anything common? Simple, yeah. Thoughts? Mobile, yeah, yeah. Well, that's obvious, yeah, they're mobile. Anything else? One more, just give me one more thing. Bueller, free, yeah, free. So. Simple, easy to use, free, mobile, blah, 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 blah. If you do this party trick, and I swear to God it works every time until you find that one person that's still using a Motorola Razor um, so it doesn't play anymore. But here's the thing. Whenever people talk about their favorite app, they do one thing. None of those, an those answers were good, but they weren't right. Because the answer is this. Every time people talk about their favorite app, they do one thing. They smile. And the reason they smile is because somebody created an emotional connection between the product being built and you. And it's so personal. 
that's back to that personal piece. And that's why you can't discount the importance of creating these personal, exceptional, exciting experiences. Apple does this better than anybody. Apple can take like, and just look at this screw. It's the most amazing screw. Only Apple could bring you this screw with its titanium grooves and the screwing mechanism. And suddenly we think that Apple titanium screws are the most incredible thing we've ever seen in our life because they know how to build that connection. So to your point of inspiration, I get inspired, your point, I get inspired by great product every time. I am not a UX designer by trade, but it's like art. I know beautiful product when I see it, and I know amazing products when I see them. Um, a great example, again, marketing people may not like this one, but one of the most amazing user experiences out there, and I will qualify this first by saying I'm not on Facebook, so I can't actually use this app, and I don't have a fake profile either. But one of the most amazing apps out there from a UX experience is Tinder. No, no, yes. And so for all the women in the room, check out the app called Stylect, S-T-Y-L-E-C-T. They've lifted that exact same user experience for shoes. No, no, yes. And then what it does is after, you know, it's, it's building up your library, and as they go on sale, you get an alert. Oh, something's on sale, 40% off. Swipe here, and away you go, and you can buy it. That, that's inspiration. When people create these user experiences that you start to see going in multiple places, that's impressive. It's great design. Sure. Other questions? Mickey's back there going, boy, we're really going to have to edit this, aren't we? Yeah. Hi, Bob. Um, I was wondering if you can tell the audience about uh, Yum technology, because early on in your um, uh, seminar, you were saying um, that we shouldn't really change our app in order to change the resolution of the actual device itself. However, Yum's combining um, a flexible screen where it allows you to have a phone as well as a tablet all in one, so therefore you can enjoy the same experience for both sets of products. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, so, so the simplest message is this. Um, every time somebody builds a product, whether it's this, yes, I still have a Blackberry, whether it's this, a Sony Ericsson, bog standard, early edition 3G phone, does not have any real apps on it, my iPhone, some other phones that I got in my bag, you're given a gift in that every time. The screen is a canvas, and the information is your paint. And you get to decide how to use that. And everything should be simple, functional, easy, every single time. It's not about information overload. It's not about saying, how much stuff can I jam into this thing? But it's also little things, too. One of the best apps that's out there that I'm sure loads of people in this room use is City Mapper. Get from A to B, right? But one of the most wonderful things about CityMapper, again, that delighting experience, have you ever read the release notes when they update CityMapper? And they go, now with the Jetpack option, which of course you can't use, but it's cool. And so what I always try to do is I always try to think about what have I been given and what can I paint on that canvas? And just do enough. Don't do too much, just do enough that makes it useful and relevant given what would be relevant in the environment where people use that stuff every time. Yes, sir. Thanks, uh, Bob. Uh, we had this brief conversation about you know, the balance between privacy, liberty, and, and security. And uh, we were talking about Google Now and you know, the fact that our, our data is all up in the cloud. I mean, can you give us some uh, personal op opinion uh, from a, an enterprise perspective as well as a personal sp perspective? So it's always a great question, the dreaded privacy question. I've decided I trust Google and Apple, and the value that they provide to me is worth whatever they're doing behind the scenes to create a great experience. So I'm all in with both of them. I think there's a lot of, um, as, we, as we talked about earlier, 
There's a lot of screaming and wailing and moaning and gnashing of teeth that's very selective when it comes to privacy and, and information and things like that. You know, we, one of the things I, I talked about, I live just outside Atlanta, Georgia. And businesses may have like a security camera sitting outside in case somebody breaks in, but they're not capturing me on CCTV every 22 seconds or whatever it is like they're doing in the city of London, right? But you trade away your own personal privacy for what you feel is security. Um, I, I, think, I think the whole thing around privacy in the cloud and all this stuff, I think it's blown completely out of proportion because people pick and choose the things that they want to most complain about rather than focusing on well, what's the benefit and what's the real risk. Now, if my stuff is being transmitted in the clear, like my credit card or whatever, I'm not going to be happy about it. But how many people have an Android phone in here, out of curiosity? Okay, I'm going to now pick on you. So, Android app. In fact, I'll pick on you. You said you had an Android app. Apple, Apple. Who had the Android? You had the Android app. Did I ask you this last time? So, what we, do you remember the last Android app you downloaded? Does anybody remember the last Android app? Okay, mini pool. And so when you download that Android app, it probably said this app wants internet access and access to your contacts and calendar. And it probably said your bank account and your passport. And what do we do? We all go, yeah, 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 baby. Give me that app. Because we trade away. We can't be bothered to read the fine print on a lot of this stuff. So in some ways, this is just my personal opinion. We don't have anybody but ourselves to blame, part one. Part two is that we like the benefits that we get from out of this stuff. The times we're going to scream is when people do stupid things. And so that's why it is important to, to have a privacy policy. It's important to manage to it. It's important to tell people what you're going to do with the data you're collecting and give people the opportunity to say, no, I don't want to be a part of it. Or, you know what, I'll opt in because I see the value that I'm going to get as a result of it. I worry out. It's peeing down buckets outside, I'm sorry to tell you. But you are free to escape unless there's any other questions. Cool. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.